Jealous mum-in-law killed my girl for her baby. <gasps> my teen sister was strangled to death, dying before she could save our brother. Oh no. Cheating husband murdered his wife with ice cream after brutal pig attack. What? Killer tried to cut off my brother's head. <gasps> Jilted groom tried to murder me. The clues were all there. My perfect was really a monster. I sent my teen into a rapist's trap. I can only hope one day she'll forgive me. Lost forever playing hide and seek. What wasn't the babysitter telling the police? My little girl was abused by her own swim coach. One of my twins suffocated at nursery. They left him in that death trap. Sex mad hubby gave me HIV after cheating. Good lord. I married my weirdo stalker. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Okay, so those are some of the, the front page standout on the shelf headlines from uh, magazines like Love It, uh, That's Life, what have we got here, Chat Magazine, uh, Pick Me Up, <laughs> it's an amusing title, and uh, Take a Break. Um, yeah, these are all UK um, women's magazines, they call them. So yeah, I... I came onto this particular issue of these kinds of magazines uh, around about 2007 when I first started posting videos on YouTube and I did have uh, a video that was on YouTube for a while on the subject back then but it was it was a very short video it didn't really go in depth about the subject and I stumbled across uh, these magazines by accident um, I normally don't even buy any magazines off shop shelves at all um, but I was in the doctor's office once uh, back then, and um, there was about five or six issues of, a, I'm pretty sure it was Chat Magazine, which is one of those ones I just read out the titles from. And um, yeah, so in the doctor's office, you know, you're sitting around waiting, you know, the doctor's behind schedule, and I look on the table, I, I'm going to read something, and you know, I will read magazines for amusement. Uh, sometimes I find the advertising stuff interesting. Um even like celebrity gossip magazines, they can be really funny to read. Uh, just the the idiocy of it all. Uh, and sometimes they're deliberately funny. Um, but yeah, I picked up this chat magazine that was in the doctor's office. It was the only thing to read on the, the table in front of me. There was about six copies of it, six different issues. Uh, and it stood out to me right away. There was some horrific story on the front about rape. Uh, and then I was like, what the hell kind of thing is that to put on the cover of a magazine? I've never seen a magazine uh, you know, a shop shelf co popular women's magazine or men's magazine uh, that has that kind of thing on the front. And then I looked at all the issues that were on the table and every one of them had the same thing on the front. Um, these bold, block, blocky titles and very colourful, uh, but with these horrific stories, stories about paedophilia, stories about rape, stories about murder, stories about torture, all kinds of horrible stuff, every issue. And I thought, wow, this is weird. I've never come across this kind of stuff before. How strange. Are these new out or what? So I started um, looking a little bit into the subject I was interested in. I found that it wasn't just this one magazine. There were one or two other publications around at the time that were doing a similar thing. And I found these magazines really... Um, I found them quite disturbing, the way um, the most horrific aspects of life are sort of promoted to the reader on the cover with these uh, big colourful titles, there's emotion-grabbing, attention-grabbing uh, catchphrases and big bold letters. And at the same time, you'd have stories on the covers about uh, how to bake a nice cake. Um, there'd be normal women's stories mixed in with horror stories about true crime. And, um, yeah, I was kind of sickened by it at first. It made me feel uneasy. Um, and there'd always be like a, a picture of a woman on the front giving a big gleaming smile, you know, a model with really nice, perfect teeth giving a smile. And un underneath it would say something horrific. You know, uh, my, my kid was um, just murdered by her dad's mate or, you know, just fucking these really horrible stories. Uh, but presented uh, in the same manner that you would expect a kid's magazine or a, a teenager's magazine to be presented with the block colours and stuff. So I was really freaked by it. And uh, recently, I became interested in the subject again because I stumbled across these magazines again and I'd forgotten about them over the years and I didn't even know these kinds of things were still going. I thought it was just a short fashion at the time. 
And uh, so I started having a look at them again, and um, I picked up um, multiple issues, which I've been studying. What's really weird about this is, I mean, I think this is very unethical. I'm not saying that these magazines shouldn't exist, but I think it's unethical that um, you can go into a shop that sells tons of magazines on a shelf, and there will be kids' magazines, uh, video game magazines, stuff like that, um, uh, those kids' magazines where you get a free toy that's that's not fucking worth much, and those crappy little toys, and the kids go, oh, yeah, I want this piece of plastic. Um, all that kind of stuff. Those magazines will be on the lower shelves where the kids can see them, and you will get these kinds of magazines on the same level on the shelf, at eye level, where, like, a five- or six-year-old kid could see them and potentially read uh, the, the titles on the cover. Uh, and I find that really weird. I mean, these are like very arguably exploitative captions on the front of the um, the magazines. The 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 definitely it's adult material. This is not stuff that you'd show to your kids, and yet there they are on the shelves at the bottom, uh, at kids' height to be read. And I think they should be up on the top shelf, um, or they should be stopped from having these kinds of horrific stories on the front covers if the magazines are going to be at eye level for kids. Okay, so um, I've been doing a fair bit of uh, reading up about this, the subject of these magazines. Uh, I've been reading up on and off about it over the last month, and I've gathered tons and tons of notes and some insights and some questions. And I just thought I'd raise uh, this particular issue to you folks out there. I, I don't, I'm not aware that these kinds of magazines uh, with this particular format and the, the type of content uh, are also released in other countries. As far as I know, this seems to be quite a UK-specific uh, format. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, maybe over in America or on the continent in Europe, maybe there are similar magazines to these in other countries. As far as I know, it's mainly a UK fashion thing that's gone on here. Okay, so I've got a ton of notes written here about these magazines and lots of references to things I've found online exploring the magazines and uh, who owns them and who who writes the stories. And I've, I've done a lot of research on it and I've written down what I consider to be the most interesting and noteworthy points. So I'm going to be uh, talking about all those things and referencing my notes as we go along here. But the first thing that I want to say is that um, I know some people will start off watching this video and they'll think, oh my God, he's going to be attacking women, saying that women are sick for reading these kinds of magazines. That's not what this video is about. Uh, I know there are some people out there who think that these magazines are designed specifically to make women hate men. Um, and I think when I first saw these magazines years ago, I was sort of of the same opinion on that. But looking at them again now and going through the various stories and reading the articles in detail and stuff, um, I'm looking at, you know, maybe 20 or 30 issues of the magazines. Uh, I no longer believe that these magazines are um, intentionally put out to attack the reputation of men, to make women hate men, or to deliberately whip up some kind of um, gender conflict. Uh, I don't think the magazines exist for that purpose. In fact, I've got some pretty damn good evidence that that isn't the case, and we'll get into that later. Actually, I'll just mention right now that, you know, just to be absolutely clear about this, men read stuff that is just as depraved and sick uh, as what's in these magazines. Uh, I mean, there's one called Serial Killer Magazine. As far as I know, that one's marketed to men, and it's nothing but serial killer stories, and it's all sensationalized and stuff. Um, I, but the, the weird thing is, is with these magazines, you've got the strange thing of horrible true crime being mixed with everyday domestic women's issues, you know, stuff to do with weight loss and, um, yeah, you know, just uh, let's knit a sweater. Oh, here's a true crime story. You know, it's that's how weird it is uh, with these ones. But um, <clears throat> with the men's magazines that cover this kind of stuff, uh, from what I can see, those magazines are specifically devoted to the subject. Maybe this is a difference between how things are marketed to men and women. Um, I think men tend to be very sort of focused on specific thing that they want. So if they're going to get a magazine on video games or serial killers or 
um, weightlifting. I think men tend to be very, I want the magazine that deals with the exact thing that I want to read about. But I think a lot of things are marketed to women on the basis that, oh, if we can connect with women's everyday uh, concerns about weight loss and celebrity status and um, infidelity and um, romance stories, if we can if we can hook women in with that kind of usual content that we have in women's magazines, and then we can give them the true crime stuff. Now, something that seems to be present in a lot of the online research about this stuff, uh, but that which gets published anyway, is that there's been a, an explosion of uh, interest in true crime. Uh, it's become very marketable uh, over the last few years. I mean, I think it always was kind of marketable anyway, but especially the last few years, it seems to have exploded. And so um, I was looking at um, some material on a, a fairly new magazine called Crime Monthly. Um, and that one, there's, there's an article in Press Gazette that talks about this. Um, and I'll quote directly from it so that you don't think I'm just making this stuff up. Crime Monthly will be found alongside women's weekly titles in shops after research from Bauer's marketing team confirmed true crime is very much a female-driven interest. Future publishing-owned monthly Real Crime, that was another magazine, which Davis described as being the closest to what Crime Monthly wants to do, but aimed more at men, closed in November after three years in print. So you see what they're, they're talking about there? They're saying that like the, the market for men in true crime uh, appears to be declining or it's not growing, but they're saying that the the female-driven interest in true crime seems to be exploding. That's what they're reporting. And they actually uh, launched a magazine called Crime Monthly for that very purpose. And they said that they wanted to market it to women. Okay, so this isn't me saying bad things about women here. This is this is what the marketplace is reporting. And I found, I found other articles um, regarding this stuff that say a similar thing. I'll just add some more quotes there. Uh, the magazine has been made in the style of a women's weekly, so it looks like something Heat readers are already familiar with. Uh, Heat was another uh, women's magazine, but it wasn't really specifically dealing with crime as far as I know. Okay, so uh, just a, another couple of things there. Um, as, well, as well as the fact that these magazines appear low on the shelf where kids can see them, there's no age restriction on who can buy the magazines as far as I know. You could be a seven-year-old kid walk into a shop get one of these magazines and read about torture rape and murder and of course the the big question i mean i'm not a type of person who who goes for censorship i there's some situations where i agree with censorship i mean you wouldn't want a kiddie porn magazine being put out there would you you know that's no good uh, so some things we do want to have uh, censorship um, but I, i'm not generally a fan of censorship uh, i like free open debate and uh, even the people I disagree with, I, I'm all for them being allowed to express their opinions at the very least, and I'll express my disagreements in return, and that's fine. But I've got no desire to silence people. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the issue is, that do these magazines uh, promote paranoia and suspicion uh, in the readers? Uh, do these magazines make people, you know, walk down the street and, oh, God, somebody's going to attack me and, oh, my neighbor might fucking abduct my kid and kill them? Or, you know, do people have those kinds of paranoias because uh, of reading these magazines? I think that's a hard one to um, statistically gauge. You know, it would be hard, hard subject to research. Um, but I would say it probably does. Um, I mean, I've read quite a few books on true crime in my life. Some of them have been horrific. I've always tried to look for the psychological books because I'm interested in uh, the motivational behavioral aspects. I'm not really into the I'm not really into the sensationalist stuff in that respect. Um, but I know for one thing that the true crime books that I've read, the really horrific ones, have changed uh, the way I view the world and have made me a fair bit more uh, distrusting of strangers. Okay, so what do these magazines cover overall? I've, I've wrote down some basic stuff you know, from the, the issues that I've bought. Um, we get subjects like weight loss, healthy eating. Um, you get bargains talked about, you know, get this uh, furniture buying bargain at such and such a shop. Um, sometimes you get nice stories in these magazines, you know, lovely things that happen. Um, but they're not usually prominent on the cover of the stories. It's usually uh, the violent 
sexually explicit. That, that kind of stuff is what gets the big, bold print on the cover. Uh, those are the main stories. And the nice stories are sort of relegated. If they're on the front cover at all, they'll be squashed into a corner somewhere with small fonts. The horror stories typically get a double page or sometimes even a three page spread story. Not that the, the stories are typically worth um, that kind of coverage. I mean, a lot of the, the way they're written are dragged out. You know, the, the story could easily be condensed to half a page uh, without losing any important information. Uh, also important with anything like this is to explore what's missing, what kind of contents are not in these magazines. Very, very few, hardly any um, articles in these magazines about politics or scientific breakthroughs. Um, and there's hardly any serious psychological breakdowns of the, the cases. Uh, you don't tend to find any statistical charts in, in these papers, uh, nothing mathematical. Uh, not that I'm a huge fan of um, statistical views of the world anyway, but you know sometimes they can be interesting and useful. Uh, but I don't think I've found any examples of a statistical chart being present in any of these magazines. Uh, surprisingly, there's really not much about the COVID situation uh, in these magazines. Uh, maybe because I bought these fairly recently, that's not the case because the whole that whole issue was sort of gradually veered off into the background and every, now everything's all war with Russia. Um, maybe if I'd have bought some issues of this a year ago, maybe there would have been some standard stories about COVID, uh, but I doubt it because, I mean, at the moment, that I'm not seeing any stories in here about uh, other major crisis issues that are being covered by the, the mainstream media. I mean, I haven't seen anything about uh, the Russia situation, but then these magazines are from a month ago. I did find, and I was really surprised to find this, there was one article uh, speaking against the lockdowns. Uh, in one of these magazines. I can't remember exactly which one it was. <clears throat> it wasn't a front cover story uh, issue. It was just a small issue, but they devoted two pages to it. And they had a lot of quotes from scientists uh, in that article. And it was, it seems to be a fairly decent article. You know, it was quite reasonable. And it, surprisingly, it wasn't promoting fear. Um, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> one of these magazines covers that issue in a non-fear manner. I was really surprised at that. Uh, but other than that, not much attempt in these magazines to educate people about issues, not even about the issues of uh, rape, serial murder, and so on. Uh, most of it is covered in a very uh, sensationalist manner. So yeah, th there's a, a strange thing with these magazines where it, it's almost like they exist in a different universe. Like on any particular day, if I go to a shop and I buy issues of these magazines and I buy issues of the usual uh, magazines uh, like maybe like uh, New Scientist uh, or Nature or any of the other men's and women's magazines and I bought some newspapers on the day all that stuff over there would all be pushing a certain reality there would, there would be a lot of coverage of COVID or there would be a lot of coverage of um, uh, a, a coming war with Russia uh, or whatever the issues of the day are, those over there will all ha feature something about that major subject. But these magazines seem to exist in their own little weird separate world um, that is you know, different to the mainstream media. Um, so you don't get the mainstream media talking about these magazines very much uh, or referencing the same articles and the same the other way. So it's like there's a whole separate reality for the reader that is present in these magazines. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, the, there doesn't seem to be much of an attempt in these magazines uh, to explore, um, to actually understand the crimes uh, that, that are being reported about. And <laughs> I found it quite funny that there are occasionally um, mainstream news media articles uh, talking about these magazines and there'll be like an interview with one of the editors or something and the editor will say something along the lines of oh you know we're just trying to educate the readers we have to operate in the marketplace so we need to get their attention uh, with the the flashy covers and the big bold stories but actually the content of the stories is just trying to educate people and occasionally I have come across the odd article 
in these magazines that appears to be a little bit more interesting and informative compared to the other ones. But a lot of the time, it really does just come off as sensationalist. Um, there's hardly ever any interviews with psychologists or police uh, to give some sort of insight. Um, the stories always seem to be geared toward emotional shock, fear, and looking at things only from the position of the victim. Okay, so just some uh, statistics on the readership, how many people are reading these magazines. Uh, just over a million reported uh, for reading Pick Me Up magazine. Uh, that report was from 2021. We've got uh, Take a Break magazine, which is reported to have 1.6 million women reached uh, by the magazine. That's in, um, that's in a one-year period. I think the other one was as well. And you've got Chat Magazine, which is apparently read by 1.4 million uh, women uh, between 2016 and 2017. Uh, something else that I found uh, <laughs> is quite funny. Um, when I was buying some of these magazines in one of my local shops, uh, the guy who was working there, I said to him, oh, by the way, I'm buying these magazines because I'm doing some research on them. You know, I knew this guy to chat to generally. And I said to him, you know, I guess I was kind of embarrassed to be reading uh, or to be buying these kinds of stupid magazines with the, the horrible stories written on the covers. And I, I just jokingly said to him, yeah, I don't actually read this crap. I'm just buying it to do a study on it. And he started saying to me that he noticed whenever, um, since there was a TV show here in Britain called uh, The Jeremy Kyle Show, and they used to have like all these idiots on the show, just these really lowbrow stories and a lot of it was about um, infidelity. It was very similar to what you guys had with Jerry Springer in the US, but it was considered even more lowbrow. And that TV show was really popular here. And uh, he said to me that ever since the Jeremy Kyle show was taken off TV, that these magazines have exploded in popularity. And he's seen, personally, he'd seen it, the, the, you know, the... The, there's more of the magazines on the shelves and there's more women buying them. Um, so, yeah, that was just from a local guy. But the, the point with that is that he got me onto the Jeremy Kyle connection. So I started looking that up. Uh, and it turns out that Jeremy Kyle himself personally wrote a regular piece in uh, Pick Me Up magazine. So there's a very strong Jeremy Kyle connection there. And another article I found in Vice.com, uh, they had some interviews with people who... Um, who work for these magazines, well, they say they had interviews with them, but that the people didn't want uh, to be named specifically. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, and so those people had to use pseudonyms. And they give a, a fairly detailed breakdown of what it's supposedly like working for one of these magazines and gathering the stories and writing them and stuff. And <clears throat> one of the things that was reported in that article is that <laughs> some of the people from these magazines would go and contact the Jeremy Kyle show to get case studies. So there you go. You got Jeremy Kyle connection again. There's the, I think that what that guy said in the store about uh, the Jeremy Kyle show ending and then these magazines exploding, it seems to be true. Okay, so what else have we got here? Yeah, the Guardian newspaper, uh, they ran an article uh, talking about um, some of these magazines and the popularity. And they mentioned that a former editor of Chat Magazine, one of these ones I just showed to you before, uh, was hired to launch Pick Me Up Magazine with a six million budget. So if you've got staff who've worked in one of these magazines who then go and work for another one, that is only going to contribute to the fact that these magazines mostly seem to have the same sort of format, the same sort of psychology, uh, just the titles of the magazines are different. Uh, but the, at the same time, you could probably, well, you can imagine that the staff in one magazine would be looking on the shelves and buying copies of the opponent's magazine so that they can look at, oh, well, well that, that one worked for them. They got good sales this week. What, what did they have on the cover? What story did they have? And then they copy it. And then as a result of that, you get all these magazines having the same sort of format. And that happens with the, the mainstream media as well. Um, a major news publication will publish a story and then something like 500 small newspapers and 
uh, magazines and news websites will all go and pluck that particular story that w was put out in the Washington Post or the BBC or something. And they will copy it, change the word, and they might do a little bit of extra research just to get an extra couple of quotes or something uh, to give a little bit more insight. But generally, it's a rehashing. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why our news media tends to all look the same. Some people think it's a, like a big conspiracy where... Um, all of the journalists and editors are being told this is th these are the subjects you will uh, cover and here's how you will cover them you know as if they all get told very specifically and explicitly that that's what's going to happen but no as I started reading up and searching on that subject I found that most of the the, the stuff is is to do with uh, the publications copying each other journalists who are in a rush a rush to reach a deadline to get some interesting story but they haven't found anything or they haven't got the budget to get out and get out of the office and travel around to go and meet people and get a real world story they just look at other publications copy change up the wording and pass it off as their own so yeah that's uh, a common thing and so yeah you, i think you get that with these magazines as well Something else important is that there are lots of women's magazines out there that don't do this stuff, that don't have all these horrible murder stories. Um, and the format of those magazines, from what I've seen, is different as well. These magazines will use sort of very block, vivid, uh, rich colours, uh, almost like you're in a, a kid's playpen with all, all multicoloured blocks and... Um, you know, so everything's blues, pinks, reds, you know, just really base colours. Whereas when you go to the women's magazines that don't use this kind of stuff, where, where they don't have um, the stories about rape and murder and so on, those magazines I tend to find uh, tend to use more brighter and pastel colours on the covers. Um, they make, make things look a bit more glamorous. They have um, more beautifully shot photos and stuff, you know, instead of just the sort of cut and paste type of appearance that you get with these things. So, really weird thing I find with these is that, um, the, the, I think the part that makes me feel kind of sick, and I'm, I'm not saying that the people who make the magazines do this on purpose, but it has this effect on me. It had it years ago when I first saw the magazines, and it still has it now. And that is that um, it's the contradictions between positive stories and negative stories, um, the, just the extreme contrast of... Um, the most horrific things being crammed together with really, really positive things on the same cover. It, it makes me feel ill uh, just to see and read this stuff. So you've got Chat Magazine uh, with the title Lost Forever Playing Hide and Seek. Um, now, they could have gone for a much worse uh, title on the cover, a much more horrific title, because when you go read the story later in the magazine, this is actually about an eight-year-old girl who was abducted, raped, and murdered um, by some guy. Uh, and on the cover, they, you know, they've got this title, but they've got this beautiful woman's smiling face right above the headline on the cover. And it just gives me this really ugh, feeling of, like, no, total rejection. I reject that. How can you... How can you link up that smiling face positive emotion with this horrific story of a child murder? Um, and again, I'm not saying that they do that on purpose. Who knows? Maybe they do. Maybe it's really cynical. Um, but it, it's something I find really um, sickening. Um, I'll, I'll go into some theories later on about why these magazines do what, what they do. Um, I'm going to save most of my theoretical stuff about it for the end. Um, <clears throat> another example of chat magazine I sent my teen into a rapist's trap and you've got a smiling woman above again and you've got a, a cake baking story in the lower left uh, just such an intense contradiction again chat magazine jilted groom tried to murder me now this is a pretty horrible story about a severe beating and face disfiguration of some girl by uh, some idiot and again, you've got a smiling woman on the cover right next to the horrible picture of the attacker. Um, look at the contrast there. This horrible looking psychopath next to this woman with a big smile. It's fucked up. Uh, and in the lower left corner, feel good fashion from £12. Uh, I don't really find it easy to feel good um, when looking at this magazine cover <laughs> with seeing this story there. Pick Me Up magazine, killer tried to cut off my brother's head and a big smile above it. 
Again, Pick Me Up magazine. A cheating husband murdered his wife with ice cream after brutal pig attack. And you've got positive stories just under it, but they're tiny. So some more stuff about presentation. Although the front of the magazines uh, often have yellows, blues, pinks, um, and that type of thing, the actual stories, the actual crime stories, they tend to use uh, both fonts and background colours that are in um, some combination of red, white, and black, and sometimes yellow. Red, white, black, yellow, those seem to be the dominant colours that are used for these stories. Obviously, red for blood, and then you've got black and white, um, which are harsh contrast to each other, and then you've got yellow, which is thrown in there, and yellow with black is you know, typically perceived as a sign of danger. Um, that's not just something that we humans have created, it's there in nature. Animals will use coloration of red and black, or yellow and black, or red, black, and yellow, or you know, they will use those colors uh, to, to give off a signal to other creatures that, hey, I'm poisonous. Um, so yeah, basic color psychology going on there with how these issues are covered. <laughs> and a, a, f a funny one I found, I was, I was reading up about a serial killer magazine, um, which uh, I don't think it's marketed to women specifically. Seems to be men and women, probably mostly read by men. Um, but that magazine uses literal cartoon depictions of um, famous serial killers. <laughs> um, I found that really funny because, I mean, the magazines are, they're almost like, it's like reading a copy of some horror magazine like Creepshow or something like that. Um, <laughs> these, these magazines, are, they're, they're supposed to scare and, you know, give it, it's, it's almost like going on a, um, a, f a fun house ride. You know, you go on a fun house ride and you get horrible things jump out at you in the dark and, oh, I got scared by that. I tend to think of these magazines as being along those lines because I don't think they're generally trying to educate people um, about these kinds of issues. And so, yeah, I found the cartoon depiction of serial killers on those covers to be quite appropriate uh, to the kind of coverage that they give. But also, um, with a lot of these serial killer cases, Typically, there's only a small handful of famous photographs of uh, the, the specific killer in question, whether it's the Night Stalker or whether it's John Wayne Gacy um, or Albert Fish, the horrific child murderer uh, from about a century ago. Um, these killers, there isn't much in the way of publicly available photos. And what photos that are available of them have been overused in articles and stuff. So I think uh, Serial Killer magazine compensates uh, for the lack of available photos uh, by having these cartoon depictions. I think I mentioned this earlier on. Um, the true crime stories in these uh, the, in these women's magazines, anyway, they're, they're, they're virtually always written from the point of view of the victim or from somebody else who empathizes deeply with the victim, like, you know, a mother who's lost a child or something like that. Um, that I've, I've not seen any examples in these magazines, in the, the coverage of these crimes, where there's any kind of um, interviews or quotes from the, the person who committed the crime. Um, there might be secondhand quotes from the victim, but that, that's about it. And there's not much in the way of psychologist interviews, like hardly anything on that, or police interviews. Everything is victim's point of view uh, to get that fear uh, response and a, uh, or perhaps even an empathy response with the victim. Also, I think I said earlier, occasionally there are stories in these magazines that um, appear to be, you know, when you actually read the details of them, it seems to be written in a sort of educational manner. Uh, there was one that I read in uh, That's Life, which is the story of a rapist dad. And reading the details, it seemed kind of like the kind of, well, truthful sort of depiction of a paedophile. You know, I'd, I've worked with them in the past uh, when I worked in uh, probation hostels. And um, so I know a little bit about how they operate. And this article seemed to be quite truthful to that, although... Anybody, any journalist could just go and read up on the subject, learn about that stuff and make things up. So um, I don't know. Um, but I, again, this is mostly written from the victim's point of view. But I also found that this particular story was actually a four-year-old story. 
um, <laughs> sorry, not four-year-old as in a four-year-old child, the story actually happened um, and broke in the news media four years ago. Uh, it didn't break big time in the news media, but there was two small newspapers, the Nottingham Post and uh, West Bridgeford Wire. Those two newspapers covered this particular uh, paedophilia father and daughter case uh, four years ago. And um, so it seems like the the magazine has just sort of picked up on that old story and rehashed it. And they got an interview with the girl who was the victim. Something funny I found was that on um, Pick Me Up magazine, I think one or two of the issues said on the cover, uh, the cheapest real life mag. <laughs> uh, cheap as in how much it costs or cheap as in uh, just really lowbrow, bottom of the barrel content. Uh, I just found that really funny. Um, okay, so we got Crime, Ma Crime Scene Magazine. Um, I mentioned Crime Monthly earlier. You got another one called Crime Scene Magazine. That one gets advertised in That's Life magazine. So you got That's Life Women's magazine that sort of throws in some true crime stuff with standard women's issues. And then within that, you get the advert for Crime Scene magazine, which is all just uh, true crime stuff. Uh, I've got I've got three editions of That's Life magazine, and all three of them had uh, Crime Scene magazine advertised in it with a full page ad. Oh yeah, and uh, <laughs> again, I find lots of humour in this stuff as well. Um, That's Life magazine. Why not just call it That's Death, you know, uh, and have a skull on the front instead of a smiling woman. <laughs> Pick Me Up magazine, on the, other, on the other hand, one of the issues that I got of that has an advert for a magazine called Crimes of Passion. Uh, but it was only in one of the editions of the magazine that I bought. Okay, so how about, what, what are the, the news media generally saying? Uh, you know, is there anybody else out there who's reporting on these magazines uh, and how weird they are and what it says about the people who write the articles and publish them? And what it says about the readership. Is there anybody else covering this stuff? Fortunately, there is, yeah. Uh, iNews did an article called Magazines that Sell Violence Against Women as Gossip Are a Shocking Read after Sarah Evert and Sabina Nessa. I think those were two other women who were murdered in the last year or two. Okay, so it's a woman writing the article. And, uh, yeah, I did have a read of this a while ago. She... Oh, it won't let me go into there without turning my ad blocker off. But I did manage to read that article a while ago. And yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a decent article. And it was talking about how immoral these magazines are. It's like they're capitalizing on, uh, tr you know, tragic true crime cases um, and selling it like they're selling fucking colorful candy. You know, it's... Uh, so yeah, she wrote an article on that in iNews, that was good. BBC published an article um, about five reasons why women love true crime. And they gave some theories on it, the fear of crime, compassion for victims, a fascination with motives. Um, although I don't buy into the fascination with motives thing because there isn't much in the way of psychological study of the uh, perpetrators in these magazines. So I don't think the fascination with motives is really that strong in, in how these are covered. Now I mentioned this one earlier that the Guardian newspaper had covered um, the success of Pick Me Up magazine when that got launched. It had quite high sales apparently. But interestingly, the Guardian did not call out any of these magazines, including Pick Me Up, um, for the the lack of morality in how they're marketed and the, the lack of morality in how the these horrific crimes are covered. You would have thought the Guardian, with its usual high moral um, opinion of itself on these things, you would have thought that they'd have talked about that, but they didn't. And um, I'll take you back to the, the Vice article, which is one of the best that I could find on the subject. There wasn't a lot of material out there, but this one was pretty decent. And they, they said that they interviewed um, people who work for the magazines. And they gave some kind of breakdown where they said that... Um, they come up with the titles of the magazines first and then they search online for stories that match it. And they search sites like Mumsnet where you get lots of uh, women telling the horror stories to each other. And then they, they, they find the stories on sites like Mumsnet in blogs. And then they try to hunt down the real people who posted uh, 
these stories and they, they pay them for it. And this would kind of explain why some of these magazines, the titles on the covers do not match the contents of the articles within. Uh, for example, let's see, I had one, where is it? I'll find this magazine a moment. So, uh, Take a Break magazine, Trapped by His Meat and Two Veg. My family heard my man cheating over Sunday roast. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first saw that, I was like, trapped by his meat and two veg. Well, meat and two veg obviously refers to his genitals. And the word trapped associated with that, it, it made me think, was, was that a rape? Which it wasn't. <clears throat> my family heard my man cheating over Sunday roast. What did they hear? Did they hear the fucking guy uh, with the woman uh, having sex upstairs and they could hear, hear them making noise from it? But no, when you actually read the article, it's completely different. Uh, they heard about him cheating at the dinner table. Um, or the girl got a phone call about it while she was at the dinner table, and then she told her family about it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the title there mismatches the actual story. Um, it was very different to what I expected from the title. Um, and so maybe this thing of creating the titles first and then finding a story to match could account for why uh, the titles mismatch quite a lot. And sometimes the stories just aren't that interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I found, you know, there's the one I just mentioned, uh, when I was reading into it, all it was was a story of a teenage girl and her boyfriend, and they had a baby, way too young to have a baby. She started nagging him all the time. Uh, he went and cheated on her, maybe because she was nagging, and she was wondering about that. Um and then they, they broke up and then a year or two later, she had sex with him again while she was drunk at some party or something. And she got pregnant to him again and now she says she won't have him back. Uh, and the whole story is written from her point of view. It doesn't give his point of view. I'm sure he might have some different things to say. But it really wasn't that interesting a story at all. It's the kind of typical um, teenage pregnancy drama situation that happens all over the country anyway. I've seen this stuff tons of times. I used to work in um, homeless hostels for young girls. Uh, and I used to come across stories that were way, way more dramatic than this, or, you know, almost on a daily basis. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was a really dull story for the magazine. They mustn't have been able to find anything horrific enough to post. But um, this Vice.com article has got uh, some quite revealing quotes. I'll, I'll read them out to you. Quote, you try every possible method of hunting the person down as quickly as possible because there will be other magazines looking for them. You message everyone on Facebook who has that name. You send letters. You cold call them. That's quite hard because for some stories, the people might be in a situation where something horrible has happened to them quite recently and you're trying to sound sympathetic while also saying, can you sign a contract in the next half hour? If a magazine gets there first to sign a story up, then it's game over. But if a news agency gets there first, a bidding war ensues. If it's a big story that's been in the news, there could be up to 20 magazines and up to 15 news agencies all wanting that story. Whoa. I mean, that sounds pretty dramatic in itself. I'd be interested to see uh, journalists writing their articles about how they try to get stories and succeed or fail at it. So to continue the quote, sometimes the contract is literally at their door within an hour. If the magazine is desperate and they know a news agency in the area, they'll pay the agency to go and knock on the door. I've never done a proper door knock. It sounds horrible. If someone's kid had just died, I couldn't do it, end quote. And as you get further into the, this Vice article, it's sort of... I got the impression that it tries to paint the journalists for these magazines as being much more, uh, sim you know, quite sympathetic people. Um, I don't quite believe that, though. I mean, I couldn't do that job myself. I couldn't work for one of these magazines and write these really sensationalist um, articles exploiting these people's tragic experiences to, to make money out of it. I, I wouldn't want to do it. Um, I'm not saying that makes me a better person than the journalists. Maybe they're the better people. Maybe they do have some good motives. I don't know. But anyway, this, this Vice article sort of tried to paint them in that way. I did find an old Facebook page um, called Kerb the Chat Mags. Um, it's only got about 10 or 11 followers. 
And that Facebook page argues uh, that these magazines demonize men. Uh, and I did mention that earlier on at the start of this video, and it's something that I disagree with um, because there are lots of stories in these magazines uh, where the perpetrators of the murders um, are women. And I think I've even seen one or two where the perpetrators are kids. Um, actually, this top one I'm looking at here, I married my weirdo stalker. Now, you could say, oh, that's all men are stalkers, blah, 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 blah. But when you read the story, it's actually, it's a bit of a boring story, really. This guy was sending flowers to this girl anonymously. <clears throat> and uh, he wouldn't say who he was. He was sending letters saying he loved her and stuff. At least that's what she says happened. Um, and then she ended up going out with this guy, fell in love with him, and then he revealed himself later on to be the one who was sending the flowers and the letters. <laughs> Not really that much of a story. Um, fuck, my own uh, love life has been more interesting than that. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this article, you know, it, the guy appears to be a stalker at the start, but he turns out to be the love of her life, and uh, she marries him, and she's really happy. So how's that demonizing men? In fact, that's the opposite. That's saying, oh, a guy who appeared to be a stalker was actually, you know, a perfect partner. Uh, where is it? I'm sure there's, there's ones here I've seen where the women were the perpetrators. Uh, yes. Jealous, jealous mum in law, jealous, jealous mum in law killed my girl for her baby. Um, and I read that story in full, and it's yeah, a bit of a dark story, that one. Um, yeah, so and the woman got sent to prison for it, but yeah, but that's not demonizing men, that's demonizing some woman for doing for killing another woman. So, yeah, I don't really buy into the thing that these things are um, designed to uh, ruin the reputation of men, <clears throat> although. Um, a lot of the stories are about male perpetrators of the crimes, you know, uh, with the rapes and the paedophilia and stuff. Uh, but I don't think that's like an agenda or anything. All right. And so um, before I get into the end here on my theories about the appeals of the magazines and the motives of the people who uh, put them out there. Um, let me just say that I don't I think I mentioned this earlier. I'm not really one for censorship generally. Um I don't think that these magazines need to be banned, but I do think that they should be put higher up on the shelves. Uh, that was one of the things that the, uh, the Curb the Chat Mags Facebook page, which has been like pretty much dead. It was from a few years ago and they did have a blog and I had to go and hunt down the blog via Internet Archive because it had been taken down. It was actually a pretty decent blog that really, really tried hard to explore the issue in detail and there was some good arguments on that blog i'll post some screenshots of that up on the screen for you people to take a look at because it does raise a lot of good points um, and whoever wrote it raised a lot of issues that the mainstream news media hasn't raised on the rare occasions that they do cover this issue but anyway i, I don't believe that these magazines should be banned i think they should they should um, a law should be made in which Stories of paedophilia, rape, torture, and murder uh, on, on these magazine covers should be put at least five feet high on the shelves in the stores so that the, the kids can't see them, so that the kids can't grab them to look at them and they can't read them on the shelves. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, or tell them, you, you, know, you either do that or you take those horrific stories off the covers if you're going to have them lower down on the shelf. Personally, I prefer to have them higher up because even if you didn't have those horrible stories written on the covers, um, some kid of like 10 years old could still pick up the magazine anyway and go through and, oh my God, so-and-so tortured my grandmother to death, blah, blah, blah. You know, and this 10-year-old is like, oh my God, what the fuck? You know, because kids, it's not easy for them to process that kind of thing. You tell kids about paedophilia and serial killers, they can get genuine fears, uh, you know, of being abducted and stuff. And these magazines could have that effect on them. Uh, but also, I mean, maybe there should be an age certificate on these magazines, you know, not for reading, you know, under, under age 15 or something like that, or at least under age 12, uh, because there is no age certificate. Anyone can pick up these magazines and read them. So I think some basic law changes in that respect would be good, uh, but I don't think they need to be banned. And even if you did ban them, um, the market desire for that content would only get filled in some other way anyway.
Okay, so let's go for some uh, theories on the appeals of these magazines and the motives of the people who, well, both buy them and uh, write them and create them and publish them. Um, I've got quite a few thoughts on this, and I'm not certain on it all. Um, you people might have some different ideas. My first theory on it is the uh, the fear cells theory. Not exactly original, but let's uh, let's just explore that for a moment. There are some situations where fear does sell. Um, you know, people like to go on a fun house ride and have scary things jump out in the dark, and that's fine. Um, but those things are very clearly not real. You're not having true crime jump out at you when you're on a fun house ride, so that's different. <clears throat> I don't really think that people want um, to be scared, to, to believe that there are paedophiles and rapists and murderers out there. I don't think people want that to be the case. I don't think they get enjoyment out of it. I think the reason for yourselves is because, you know, we've all got a survival instinct. And so the news media does this all the time. Oh, my God, this is going to happen. Oh, there's going to be a nuclear war. Uh, oh, here's fucking um, some horrific thing that's going to threaten you. Aliens are going to invade or whatever. You know, there's always some sort of... that. Uh, most of the news media is about things to be afraid of. But most people don't want to spend all the time afraid. They want to be happy. Uh, you know, if you meet up with your friends and your family, what do you talk about? You don't instantly launch into all negative stuff. I suppose some people do. A lot of us, when we meet up with friends and family, we talk about positive things. What good experiences have you had lately? What successful things are happening for you? What are you doing next? Blah, blah, blah. And you try and keep it positive. And you enjoy that. Um, I think that's the kind of stuff that people want. But with the fear sells thing, it's it's that the publications are they know that if you're presented with something that is a threat, you want to understand the threat so that you can find a way to prevent it from happening. And so I think that happens with these magazines. Um, I don't think that a lot of women want to go around being afraid of everybody in the world and scared that there's someone's going to rape them and stuff. I think these magazines push that idea and then the women get scared of it and then they buy the magazines because they want to learn more about it. Um, yeah, I'm not totally certain about that, but that's the fear sells theory. Another one, um, this is more from the publisher's point of view, I, I call it the competing depravity theory. Um, you know, you've got a bunch of these magazines that are competing with each other on the shelves and each one has got its own horrific titles and horrific stories. And I take it that when one has a particularly nasty story that is really attention grabbing, they get a high sales for that week. And then the other magazines try and compete with it and say, oh, you know, we need something that's even more hardcore than that, something more attention grabbing, something more shocking. And so the magazines are constantly competing with each other to get to the bottom of the barrel of taste. Um, whereas if it was only one magazine that didn't have competitors, maybe they wouldn't sink so low. I also noticed that these magazines don't tend to advertise in each other's magazines. Uh, you don't tend to pick up a copy of Chat Magazine and find uh, Take a Break Magazine advertised within Chat Magazine, um, although that would make sense because you would expect the audiences to cross over with each other. Um, and so that suggests to me that the magazines are in direct competition, the fact that they don't talk about each other, uh, they don't advertise each other. And you get that with the mainstream news media as well, uh, especially when you get news publications who are uh, consider each other to be ideological opposites. They don't like quoting each other. Um, if they do quote each other, it'll be to try and demonize the other publication. Um, yeah, I mean, you, do, you don't get like Fox News uh, allowing advertisements for the Washington Post on, on its site or the New York Times. Um, here in uh, Britain, you don't get the Daily Mail having an advertisement uh, for ITV or something like that. You know, it's funny how they, these, um, you can kind of tell when these publications are in competition with each other because they don't promote each other's work and they very rarely quote each other. And if they do quote each other, it tends to be negative. And you might get some um, situations where you, you could get a couple of these magazines that are owned by a parent company. Um, you know, a parent company owns them both. I, I think there is a couple, actually. I'm sure I wrote them down here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Chat Magazine and Pick Me Up are both owned by Future PLC. 
so you've got the same parent ownership company, and yet in the marketplace, the two magazines are competing with each other, I suppose. So if, if Chat, Chat Magazine and Pick Me Up are written by two completely separate um, editing and journalism teams, then even though they're under the same parent company, they could still be argued to be in competition with each other. Yeah. I guess in a way it's not that much different to like two different companies who've been in, in competition going to the bank and getting a loan off the same bank. They're still in competition. Another sort of half-baked theory, half-baked, it's quite a appropriate term for what I'm about to say, is that um, I've got this phrase psychological candy written down here as a, a, a possible motivational factor behind these magazines. Um, and I've wrote down here that um, the magazines parallel with kids' colourful candy, uh, and that candy is actually bad for you and can make you feel sick, but in the moment it gives you a rush of adrenaline or emotion. It gives you some sort of a rush. Sometimes people are like that. They want to have an emotional rush, whether it's a good or bad feeling. Um, they just want to have that emotional rush in the moment just so that they can feel something uh, if they happen to be bored. And I guess you could say that, you know, these kinds of horror stories fulfill that. Maybe the people who read them don't th spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what these articles imply about life and um, thinking about the, you know, the sort of intellectual implications of these cases. Uh, they just get the rush. Oh, my God, that's terrible. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, that, that's all, totally awful. How could somebody do that? Oh, I could never forgive somebody for that. Oh, isn't the world awful? And then they just move on and f forget about it and think about something else. So it's just like a candy rush. But something else, which, as I was studying these magazines, I wasn't really expecting to come to this conclusion, but it has sort of dawned on me slowly as I've been studying these magazines over the last month. Um, I kind of viewed these magazines as being quite unique. It's like, what the hell are these magazines doing? That's totally different to what I'm normally seeing with published news media. But when you go around looking at the, the, the standard uh, news media, uh, even the most respected ones, you do get this candy rush thing going on. There, there tends to be an emphasis on emotion. There tends to be a lot of fear selling. Um, I mean, even the most intellectually written uh, news organization needs to get its readers involved. It needs to pull them in emotionally so that they want to read more. And so uh, strong emotions is the way to do that. And um, fear is one of the strongest emotions of them all. And so even your, your mainstream news media will, will hit you with fear, 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 fear. But um, it's usually disguised behind a, a variety of so-called intellectual statements, so-called intellectual arguments and rhetoric. But the ultimate message is, here's a rush of fear. You need to keep watching or keep reading our publication so that you stay informed about the terrible thing that could happen to you. That is something that dominates in most of our news media anyway. And with these magazines, I find it's the same thing again, except the contradiction is more blatant. So if you go and tune into BBC or Fox News, um, doesn't matter whether it's so-called left or right wing, you get the same thing across the board. Um, you know, one minute you'll get a story about a horrific murder, and then the next minute you get a story about uh, something really nice that happened. Oh, some celebrity got married, and look at the lovely photos. Um, one of the weirdest ones I find is, uh, you know, certain publications will say, oh, here's this celebrity who you all know about, you all know her name, and here she is, she got seen in a bikini, doesn't she look great? And then the next story next to it in the publication will be, oh, a war has broken out in such and such a country. And it's like, what the fuck? What is this schizophrenic stuff, you know, where you've got these contrasting positive, negative emotion stories. You've got some stuff that's actually relevant to our lives and you've got some stuff that's just completely shallow garbage mixed in with stuff that's really important. And it's very schizophrenic, the news media. And... Um, I find with, with these um, true crime, women's general life mixture magazines, 
you've got the same contradiction going on that we get with uh, the usual news media, um, but the contradiction is more blatant. It's more obvious. It's so obvious that it's quite jarring. It's it's the contradiction itself is as much a shock as the actual stories. At least for me, it is anyway. Um, I mean, you know, take like say um, know, the, the BBC or any news channel really. You get all like pretty colourful, swirly graphics at the start and music, dun, 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 and the fucking all the graphics come in and the camera swoops in in a nice, colourful, beautiful set, and then you got this news reader who says, "Oh yes, well, uh, so many thousands of people have died uh, today from whatever." Or, uh, oh yes, nuclear war could break out any moment. And yet you just had all this colourful candy graphics as you were going into that story. It's so fucking weird. Um, so yeah, I, that's a conclusion I've come to, is that these mag magazines are a... They are a magnification, a magnification of the kinds of uh, hypocrisy and contradictions that we get in normal news media coverage anyway. <clears throat> okay, and on to the last thing. Because um, I want to... I want to finish on a positive note here. I don't I, I don't want this to be a video that's all about oh isn't the world awful that we're just getting sold horrible stuff in magazines and isn't it terrible how the news media works and blah 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 blah. I don't want this just to be a video about that. So I decided to finish on um sort of a positive note anyway. Some of you might be sickened by this. But I find there's a lot of comedy in these magazines. Uh, just like there is in the mainstream news. And um sometimes it's actually quite intentional. Okay, so I wrote some down here. I was trying to find the magazine. So there was one, the, the I Married My Ex Stalker story, which I mentioned before, was actually quite... Fun. Oh, yeah, it's right on the top again. I Married My Weirdo Stalker. Uh, so I went and read this one all the way through, and it was a crap story, really, but there were some parts of it that really made me laugh, and I, I wrote down one of the quotes here. Um, so, yeah, she's going out with this guy... And she'd forgotten all about the guy who was anonymously sending her flowers and stuff. And then the boyfriend who she's really with and she's in love with. <laughs> I, I wrote down a quote here. He says he needs to confess something. And then she says, is this where you tell me you're gay? And that just, I was not expecting that in the story. It just cracked me the fuck up. Um, <laughs> it was just nothing to do with the... The main line of the story, but I frequently find with these articles, um, there are, there are moments like that that really have me laughing. Uh, let's see, that's like I think that's life had a couple of really funny ones on the covers as well. Oh fuck yeah, this this one I was in stitches with this one. Uh, my fella ditched me after dental surgery. The guy had the most terrible teeth you can imagine, and um, he got new teeth. He went abroad and he got like surgery in his mouth he got these lovely new gleaming white teeth and it says his veneers landed him in bed with two dodgy deers okay so let's go to the article which is on page six and it is really funny i think the guy actually probably volunteered to take part in this this article <laughs> i don't know how they got the photos of him maybe she had them anyway uh, but you get the, these funny pictures before and after with the teeth and uh the, just the the write-up is hilarious they call it pot Mark's pearly frights, not pearly whites. When Kirsty's fella flew to Turkey to get new teeth, his look went from below par to porn star. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and yeah, you know, throughout this article, there was various jokes about teeth and stuff. And the, the story was written in a very funny way, in a, a sort of Jeremy Kyle kind of funny way. Actually, um, yeah, you guys, Jerry Springer, remember how funny Jerry Springer was? Um, I mean, occasionally they'd have a serious episode, but a lot of the time, Jerry Springer was just circus comedy stuff. And I used to watch it because it was so funny. And some of the people they had on there were really funny as well, like deliberately funny, you know. I mean, you've got uh, stupid titles like this, you know. Is, is that a hammock? No, it's my bra. <laughs> my triple M boobs nearly crushed my baby and they keep growing. You know, just... Real stupid, funny stuff. I mean, they must have known that people would laugh at that when they read it. Yeah, there's another one. Again, this is That's Life. That's Life are pretty good for the humour on this stuff. Uh, fella rented hotel rooms for sex after I gave birth. Holiday in, more like holiday sin. <laughs> I rocked the baby, he rocked the bed. 
brilliant, you know. Um, so I guess you can kind of take these magazines with a pinch of salt, a light-hearted thing, uh, where it's... You, you could say, in, in defense of the people who, who make these magazines, life is very, very tragic, and so sometimes you just need to laugh at the tragedy. I mean, you can find humor in most things in life, and they managed to do it. Fortunately, I haven't seen them making any paedophile jokes in there, but stuff like infidelity... They have a, a proper good laugh with that stuff, so that's fine. All right, yeah, so um, that's it, really. It just, God, it's a bit longer than I expected. Uh, yeah, I find these magazines fascinating. I find them sickening. At the same time, I find them hilarious. Um, yeah, what do, I don't know. What do you folks think? Um, do you get to see magazines like this? Who buys them? Who reads them? What kind of people are they? Uh, that was one thing about the demographics, um, I didn't find any advertisements in these magazines uh, that would that would suggest that the people who buy the magazines have got much money. I think the magazines are aimed at lower to middle class um, women who haven't got a lot of money to spend. Maybe they live a bit of a dull life. They're just stuck looking after the kids all the time. And, you know, maybe the husband's out working all the time and they're a bit bored and feel um, maybe even a bit neglected or something. And so these things are just a form of shallow escapism, and I guess they're entitled to that if that's uh, what they enjoy. I mean, I watch horror films, you know, I well, watch lots of different types of films, but um, I love things like Hellraiser, and Hellraiser is way more horrific than anything in there. Actually, that's not quite true. Hellraiser doesn't have any explicit paedophilia going on, although it is implied in the film. Um, yeah, I mean, we all have... Our, desires to explore dark things um if only to familiarize ourselves with potential dangers so uh, yeah i don't mean this video to knock the people who read the magazines or to knock the people who write them um but i'm interested in the issues and yeah i just thought i'd throw all this stuff out for you folks to have a think about and discuss let me know what you think in the comments section it's okay i'm rob ager hope you enjoyed this Lots and lots more videos on psychological issues, news media, movies, any kind of media I'm interested in studying. Check out my channels and my uh, my website, collativelearning.com. Follow me on Facebook for more and uh, on Twitter as well. I've got a Patreon account where you can access more material. I've got merchandise on the site. Check that out as well. See you folks soon. Bye bye.